right. So as you are probably aware, and this webinar is um, you know, about overcoming organizational impediments um, in agile transformation or really in any sort of changes. OK, so you are probably aware this is the third of the four webinar uh, on agile transformation, which I'm leading. OK, so in the first one, we talk about agile transformation from the change perspective. We understand, you know, the importance of change and understanding change from the human perspective versus from the organization like process technology perspective. And then the second webinar, we talk about like developing change strategy for agile transformation. Today is the third one, which we'll be talking a little bit about impediments which we might come across as we are trying to, you know, uh, encourage our teams to adopt agile ways of working. And then we, we can talk about, like, like, drill into some examples of those other impediments and how do we deal with them. Okay, and from there, can we actually generate some, uh, some information on the process, how we deal with it, or on some of the general approach in terms of, okay, when it happens in reality, what can we do about it? Okay, and the last one, uh, which is in three weeks time, and if you're interested, my colleague will pop a link in the chat as well, and that's when you talk about facilitating change for agile transformation. So we are going to look at how we can leverage facilitation to force a culture of continuous improvement, and how we can engage our stakeholders throughout the whole agile transformation process. Okay. So these are the four webinars in the series, which is one topic which we teach in the CAT class, Coaching Agile Transformation, which is accredited by IC Agile. Okay, this is just one topic of it, which I find very interesting, hence why I'm sharing this knowledge with you. Okay, so as we've talked about, uh, today is on the third webinar, and our game plan is we have done the greeting, we have done the introduction, brilliant, and we are going to talk about uh, uh, sorry, we're going to talk about a little bit about organizational impediment, and we're going to have some examples, drill into you know some of the examples and strategies in terms of how are we going to address those impediments. Okay, and from there, as I've mentioned earlier, to generate in terms of okay as an approach. So we're seeing all that great, and how are we going to generate some of the approaches, processes, or principles that which we can apply in the future when we confront with those impediments. And then towards end, if you have any questions, uh, if you have any observations, I'm more than happy to address those. And also we can talk a little bit about how we can help you, okay, to pave that journey. What other qualifications are in the market which can be potentially helpful to build your career? Okay, right. Let me take a quick pause there. Any questions or any anything you would like to raise? Right, I will take that as a no. And just so you are aware, okay, uh, earlier in the day, I was talking to a colleague of mine and I said, today is the day I felt like, like my body woke up, but my head hasn't. You know, I'm not sure if you have got the same uh, experience like I do, but today is literally how I felt in that way for some bizarre reason. It's just a bit tiring for me. So if you like this webinar by the end of the, the hour, which we spent together, and I want you to know that I can do even better. And if you don't like it, and I'm telling you right now, that could be the reason why. Okay, so we set this thing straight. Okay, so with that note, what I would like to invite you to do is I would like you to think a little bit about organizational impediment, which is the major topic we're going to discuss today. So when we talk about organizational impediments, what are we referring to? We are referring to the barriers, the challenges, and the, the, the difficulties or obstacles which organizational face when we are trying to adopt or implement a new way of working. Yeah, so maybe be agile transformation, maybe some change in technology, uh, maybe some sort of like, you know, differences in the process which we're trying to adopt. It doesn't matter. But those are literally, as an organization, as we are trying to get, uh, you know, better uh, in our performance and getting better in a way how we work together. And these are some of the common things which we probably will confront as an organization. Okay, so. What I would like to ask you to do is to reflect on your experience in terms of if now you switch on the Google in your head, okay, trying to think about what are some of the organizational impediments you have experienced in agile transformation, or even broader, 
in any change which you have experienced in your organization. So have a think about it. Have a think about it. I'm, I'm going to give you a very quick 30 seconds to reflect. Okay, I hope you all had some time to reflect and then trying to have some ideas of some of the common uh, like themes of impediments which you have experienced. So just to make that experience easier, I have listed out a number of organizational impediments here on my screen. Okay, and what we're going to do is we are going to launch a very quick poll, yeah? And I would like you to refer to your experience and then take all the impediments which you have experienced in, in your like um, work setting. Okay, so AXA, can you help me to launch the poll, please? AXA, are you there? Yes, me. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you please help me to launch the poll, please? Ah, oh, yes. Just a second. Oh, it's loading me. Just a second. Okay, or else let me have a try as well from my end. Okay, is it launched? I'm trying to open. Jenny. Are you able to launch it? Uh, not yet. Okay, not to worry. So ladies and gentlemen, you have the question actually on my screen. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen again. So what I want to do is multiple choices, whatever applies, could you please share your opinion in terms of what you have encountered before? And I'm sharing my screen, hopefully you can see it. If you can just use the chat window, please, just to say that, okay, I have experienced with operational silos, for example, or resistance to change, so on and so forth. So whatever apply, please make your selection. And I'm gonna give you a minute of that, okay? Trying to select whatever that applies. I mean, can you see me? I launched the poll question. That's fine, Aksa. I've already asked participants to move on to give me the answers. It's fine. Don't worry. Can you please close it? Yes, me. Thank you very much. Okay. So I have got some answers. What about the rest of the room? Whatever applies, please. Okay.
Okay, thank you very much. So, in the context of agile transformation, okay, and we talk about different types of organizational impediments. So, as you can see, as professionals working in the field, we all experience different levels or you know different contexts and different impediments when we're trying to go through the process, and. All these answers are selected from researchers, okay? So based on different researchers and they come to the common theme. And then these are probably all selected from the most common uh, kind of like answers in terms of what are the common impediments people come through as they go through agile transformation. So someone said all of them, okay, it's actually true. Yeah, there might be other stuff, you know, I'm, I'm sure, but generally speaking, these are some of the major category which we're looking at. So what we're doing today is I have selected a few things which I think are, are very interesting, okay, which I would like to look at with you. So what we do is we will go through them in a bit more detail. And obviously, these are from my perspective and from my experience. If you have got a better opinion, better view, please do not hesitate to share that with the rest of the, uh, with the, rest of the room as well. All right. So let's take a look. What I would like to do first is talking about operational silos. Okay. So I hope that sounds familiar. Yeah. Because this is something which I find often, especially uh, in like a big organization, is very common and probably one of the most widely witnessed organizational impediments. Yeah. And this can be obviously as a very significant obstacle for us to achieve agile transformation. So in a way, if you think about it in that way, because different organizations, different functions, different teams, it makes sense because they have their own functional or, you know, like a specialized area. So it, it makes sense for them to work together very closely. However, if you look at it from a broader view, if you have like a bird eye view, like from the top, you will see that all these little silos, they operate in its own right. Yeah, because there's a lack of cross-functional communication. There's a lack of like uh, any sort of like interaction or, you know, interrelatedness in between. Okay, and hence why we don't see the whole chain. We don't see the whole process, the whole value chain or the whole process. And this, Okay, without doubt, will definitely have the impact on the uh, sorry communication and collaboration of the team, and obviously impacting on our ability to respond to the market because the information is simply not passed quickly enough to the next team. And some people might know, some function might be aware, and some people might not. So this is where the whole thing is broken. Okay, so it's in, literally in pieces. And. I still remember when I was younger and I live on one of the major streets. And then I can guarantee you 80% of, of the time, okay, the street is undergoing some some sorts of work. It can be uh, for like doing a new water pipe. It can be, oh, they're trying to, you know, get in the, the new telecom wires or uh, electricity and stuff like that. So 80% of the time, the road is being open and someone is doing some work. And I have always got the question because I am pretty sure that if all the department of the government trying to liaise together, if they're having a better plan in terms of, okay, we are opening this road during this time period, can we actually coordinate for all the work to be done in the same time? They will save so much time, energy, and also cost, you know, to avoid all this kind of like issues, which the clients as the people who live next to the street will have better um, let's say better experience, you know, using the road. So when you talk about organization, you also have the same problem, yeah? Because when we walk in silos, we don't see the whole picture. And sometimes we might be doing the same thing, although in different teams. In my work experience, I have observed that and have experienced it, okay? So it's like one of the big piece of work. After we went out to procurement, after we spoke to all this kind of party, we find out the solution. But then like literally a month later, we find out, you know, someone, some team literally going through the same thing, okay? So for that whole process, we could have spoke to each other and then get things done in one go versus we do our bits and they do their bits and it's just completely kind of like, kind of like a waste, which is really a shame. Okay, so 
Operating in silos will have issues and that will negatively impact on our performance innovation. And also, you know, from the employee perspective, you know, you felt less engaged. And from the customer experience, you felt like, wow, you know, we could have made it better uh, rather than, uh, um, you know, being like isolated and not being content in one goal and also impact on the service delivery as well. Okay. So we know what operational silos are. And my question to you is, how do we address this? Okay, how do we address this? So these are some of the things which I have witnessed success. And I'm not saying these are uh, exhaustive list. It's definitely not. So if you have better ideas, by all means, shout out to the team. But for the time being, what I want to focus on is when you have silos, I mentioned about the bird eye view. So you need to have that common vision and the common goals in terms of high people. You know, this is what we're heading. This is how we can align our effort towards the same go the same direction and when you have that north north light everything will become easier because this is where people start to think you know like uh where do we stand in the whole process where do we stand in the whole value chain and um where do we stand in the whole system and this is where people can talk to each other and then start to communicate and then start to work together and so that you know we can kind of like tackle you know the the silo uh, which exists and one thing I think would be really useful is you can set up some sort of like cross functional touch points. Yeah. And these are different offices or different roles, responsibilities, which you can have. And when the people, you know, start talking to each other, they will understand, OK, what is in the pipeline? What is coming out our way and what is the other people are doing? So once they start having all this communication, it will become easier. Yeah. And that's why we promote cross-functional teams in Agile, because when you have all these functions aligned and working together, and this journey will be smoother. Okay, this will become, become easier. All right. And there was a survey, I think, which is being done, um, I think is by PwC in 2015. So literally what they were saying is that a lot of companies, I think it's like a large percentage, 60, something like that, of the companies believe that the cross-functional collaboration is definitely something which can help them to achieve strategic success. Yeah, and then there was a lot of data being provided, but ultimately highlighting how important it is to actually have cross-functional teams working together in organizations. All right, so moving on. So resistance to change. So again, okay, so resistant when we talk about resistance to change, we're talking about basically employees, um, you know, they are, generally not liking change. I mean, apart from the fact that it is actually a human nature, not liking change is normal. And as human beings, we are creatures of habit and routine. So this is normal, okay? So what we're trying to say here is, please anticipate it, right? If we're saying that, oh, everyone loves change, it's almost impossible. So the goal is really to anticipate it and try to minimize and manage the resistance, you know, which is from our employees. So how do we do that? How do we do that? Here, I've listed out a few things as well. Okay, so first of all, we need to understand like the people's journey and how we can help them to smooth this journey. So this is what we talk about a lot in the first webinar, as I've mentioned. So we look at things from the human perspective and then, you know, how we can help them, how we can, you know, like make this journey easier for them. And then what I strongly believe myself is prevention is better than cure. OK, what does that mean is so before people can tell you, you know, I don't like this, I am resistant to all the changes or before they can demonstrate this to you, trying to see what is it you can do. Right. Trying to see that am I able to cascade into some communication in terms of like being aware of this coming, uh, be aware of this uh, uh, agile transformation coming your way. Am I able to do something in advance to make this journey easier? Hence why I said prevention is better than cure, because you can help journey to pave that journey making them understand why we're doing it in the first place, which will make a dramatic difference and to change the attitude towards the change. OK, and I also put communication time three because communication, according to me, is absolutely key in any sort of change or communication. So please do remember, communicate, communicate, communicate. And that doesn't mean one way, like you telling them information is actually two way because you need to take the feedback from that as well in terms of, OK, what is it that you are not so happy about? And we can pivot, we can change and we can make it suit or we, we can actually adapt accordingly. So these are the things. 
And I also mentioned about IKEA effect. So IKEA effect is literally something saying that, you know, um, when people when people have like involvement in certain things, they will place higher value, you know, on the particular things. For example, if people has actually put the effort into putting this furniture together from IKEA, right? And they'll be thinking, okay, this is something which I made it myself. So they will give it more value. And similarly, in any sort of like process, if you involve people and make them part of the journey, they will have more buy-in. Okay, so literally involve people, getting their feedback and asking them to help you, asking them to become your alliances and to push this change all together. And this will help you from that end. And always lead by example. Oh, always lead by example as leaders, scrum masters, or, you know, like any sort of like the team which you're leading. So be the example and show people it's okay, right? It's okay. You know, the person who add tomato for the first time, previously people think it's poisonous, but it's not. After one young man demonstrated in front of like a, a city hall, right? Everyone's not eating tomato. So don't be afraid to be the person who is eating the tomato or lead by example saying, it's okay, we try this change and this is the benefit that we can, you know, achieve from it. Okay, and obviously it is an ongoing thing. Any change transformation, it takes time. So don't say that, okay, I'm just gonna give a push and here, here we go, you know, job done. So this is ongoing support. What is it you can do, you know, from teaching, training, coaching, and what is it to help to sustain the change? And this is something we're also discussing in webinar one as well. All right, next one I wanna talk about is decision-making, okay? Slow decision-making. So I'm not sure how many of you actually worked in um, like big organizations, like large organizations, but from my experience, like large organizations normally have the same issue of slow decision making. Okay. However, these might um, depend on various teams, various contexts, and also, you know, depends on number of issues, which I listed here saying that, you know, depends on, uh, do you actually have access to timely and reliable data? And, you know, what is the layer of hierarchy which you're involved in? And also, you know, do we have absolute clarity over who is doing what, who is in charge of what? And always the nature of your business as well. You know, are, are you actually uh, working in a risk averse or risk taking culture? So all this will have a play, but generically, big organizations will have probably bigger problems in terms of um, you know like decision making because of, because of the layers and the hierarchy and the process involved in there. Okay. So I remember when I was working in a bank, there was one change request which we submitted. And literally the moment we hit the send button to submit the change request, I saw that for that change to be approved, we have like eight layers. So we have eight people in the line to approve that one change request. And obviously the change request which we submitted is to test some data in a live environment across the border of the country. OK, and that will involve a lot of department like data and information security, information assurance and also, you know, testing and all these people are involved in the whole field of approval. And for us to get that approved, OK, we anticipate at least at least a month. Yeah, so that makes us think what is it we can do to actually make it quicker? What is it we can do to make it quicker? So we did a couple of things. So this is what I, I use the example to think what we did. So hence why I have got the strategy to overcome those uh, uh, slow decision making. So first of all, we did our own due diligence in terms of, okay, what is the information we need? What would IA, information assurance or data asking us in this scenario? And what did we do you know, in advance to address those questions before they are even raised to us. So we did all our due diligence and we talk about this, we managed our risks and then getting everything done and okay, great. So this is something which we provided the whole thing, okay, the whole idea and the whole, um, like literally the, the, the plan of what we can do with the risk assessment to our sponsor. And we leveraged the help from our sponsor, you know, to get a very quick approval and across the line. So this is what we did. So do your hard work, do your due diligence, and then take from there, okay, we worked as a team, right? We self-organize and we are working like to our best to provide information and then to enable that decision-making from our end, as well as understand the risk appetite because we cannot make that call. Someone senior has to make that call on our behalf. So who will that be as our sponsor? So trying to understand your context, where your team is standing and where your 
um, you know, like the next level, let's say your management level or your executive level. So we all have different level of risk appetite. So understanding that and understanding the threshold and how are we going to push, you know, for the decision making. And also make sure that, you know, you have, um, you, you, you're trying to create like a safe environment for people to take risk because ultimately, you know, it is about the unknown. Everything is a risk, but fail is not fail, but a fail is actually the first attempt in learning. So with that in mind, let's test our approach with the threshold of risk. Let's see what is what we can do. Okay. And obviously this will come hand in hand. It's not something like, oh, I can just go ahead and do it. No, within controlled risk. Yes, we can risk it. We can do it. But if it's above the level, make sure you understand it and then make sure that you ask for high level of approval. Okay. So that's about that decision making. And moving on. One more thing I want to add uh, is regarding knowledge management. Okay. And sometimes I worked in different organizations and I felt like it's such a waste because the information is not being managed and knowledge is wasted uh, when people move along the jobs and it was never being kept in a certain way. And sometimes I look at this, you know, when people left the job and no one else knows how the things operate, which is a great risk and which is also a great waste, according to me. So when we talk about knowledge management, what we're talking about is the um, the application of a process. Okay, so within this process, we we um, we help the information to flow from the from the right people to the right people from the um, like the sorry from the right people to the to the other right people at the right time, so that they can efficiently and effectively using this information to create some sort of value. And when we talk about the poor knowledge management, and this is where we can observe like a lack of awareness, which is about the spread of information, okay? So I've been working in some of the organizations where they are they have got very detailed procedures and detailed process in terms of how we manage like information. And um, in some of the banks I've worked with, for any documentation, for any, let's say artifact you produce, they always have got different confidential level assigned to it. Yeah. So from there, you will know where the information is going. Is going external, internal, public, or is confidential? And I've also seen some like other practices where it was not managed properly, where things literally, you, you have um, information about a particular project. You have everything like the financials, the clients and everything, but it was not managed. And everyone can assess it from like a shell point or something, which is a potential danger. So these are the things uh, what you need to watch out for is about the access and the spread of the information. And the other part to the knowledge management is regarding the knowledge. So this is regarding what you know and the knowledge which can be transferred, you know, from team to team, department to department. And this is sometimes I observe there's lots of waste because, you know, sometimes it's not like being managed in such a sense that, you know, it's, it's preserved and it can be passed along. Okay, it's, it's mainly with the person. If the person left, and here we go, the chain is broken. So think from those perspective. And then um, another thing is, I think regarding knowledge management, it's so important that we learn from our past experience and using those information to help us to make informed decisions. So one story I have got here is literally talking about, you know, like organizations like for because I work in change a lot so I've seen projects portfolio and I've seen that like there was one portfolio I worked for they actually have got a massive lessons learned log yeah so for those of you who doesn't know lessons learned log this is basically like a document to keep or information of what are lessons which we've learned from our projects going in the past I actually find that document really useful and is so indicative to help us to guide us saying that look fellows these are the mistakes we, we made before don't make the same mistakes again or these are the contacts if we need some information and here we go you don't need to go through the circle along the organization but these are the key contacts you have so Having those knowledge management and having those system and how, you know, helping to capture and assess those information is crucial. Yeah. So I have summarized some key points here in terms of what I felt, you know, can be useful to you. So literally having a workflow in terms of how we capture, access, utilize and manage our information and also, you know, have some sort of like practice and, you know, or um, like different roles, functions or um these kind of things to actually help you to create knowledge sharing platform or functions. 
So in one organization I worked, we have got a brown bag lunch session. What does that mean, brown bag lunch session? It's literally we have lunch together. Okay, so you bring your lunch to the table. And then for each of the session, you can invite one SME. So it can be from related area. It can be talking about topic, which is something which you're not aware of. So that brown bag session, I found very useful so that we can share we can share about critical knowledge and then this is um, you know something which I think you know within the time which we have in organization in busy hours something we can easily slot in and something which is implementable okay and obviously okay um I did mention here saying that you know a, a culture of learning this is very important as well so we need to force the culture of continuous learning and remember okay uh, like um I actually put it in different way. So sharing is caring. So when you share information, that means you care. And oh, I do have some open sources, you know, from my end, which I share with my team openly because I do feel like they can benefit away from it. And then it's for me, it's not very difficult. Note down few points. You don't have to be perfect. But what are the key information which you want your team to benefit from? Then start from those things. And I think you know you yourself and your team will benefit from it. Okay. So on that end, I've been talking a lot. Let's take a quick pause. And what I want you to think of now is we talk about all these like examples of um, particular organizational impediments. We talk about ways how we can address this. So obviously, when you go back to your working environment, and it's not limited to all this, you will have different challenges. And this will enable us, you know, to have a looking at things from a different approach, which is if we are going to take a step back. Okay, and let's stop looking at the specific problem. If we're looking at the process from the process perspective, how do we actually address those impediments? So this is something which I've summarized. Okay, so let's have a very quick go through on this. So we recognize the impediments. And this is where, you know, we communicate like how things are going, what you are doing, what's your objectives and what are your milestones. We have understanding of the things deliverables and we also reflect on the processes, you know, on the things which we're doing. So by communicating and reflecting and um, by doing that often, we can help each other to raise the awareness and we can see, okay, what are some of the major events that happened? And maybe from there, is there a pattern being observed? Okay, and if we do need more information, can we have some sort of a survey assessment to help us to detect and understand all those symptoms which has been happening? So recognize those impediments, it's a starting point. So we know it's there, we're aware it's there. Next step is on prioritizing, uh, prioritizing the impediments. So sometimes we have so many things. If you if you ask me, what are some of the things you want to change about the process or about this organization, about how we're working, I can probably give you a list of things. But are we going to do everything in one go? The answer is probably no. Okay. So within all these like impediments which we would like to address, where do I start? So this is where the prioritization comes in. So. I think working in Agile, you must be aware of some of the techniques already. You know, we talk about Moscow, we talk about um, now, next, later. We talk about some two by two matrix like impact effort, um, impact influence, something like that. So think from those end, right? And then starting from the low hanging fruit in terms of what is easy for us to do something and then that can help the team or to, to, um, to literally lift the team spirit, let's say, for example, okay, to change the morale of the team. What is the something which is like, we can apply the 80-20 rule, like the 20% of effort we can take, which will make 80% of the difference. So start and with those and prioritize those to start with. So once you got that, okay, I have got like a few items on my list now so that I can, you know, start working on them. Then trying to think about, you know, who, um, like, or who is accountable or who is responsible, okay, to address those impediments. So be careful because responsibility and accountability is different. Yeah, who is doing it versus who is responsible for it. And uh, sorry, who is accountable for it is two different ideas. So we're trying to balance you know, if we are going to actually do the work per se, say not me, Ming, I'm going to help the team, I'm going to do X, Y, Z, or I'm going to empower the team, saying that, okay, as a team, let's work on this. As a team, 
and I'm, I'm asking powerful questions. I can help as a coach so that, you know, I'm not actually doing the work, but I'm empowering the team to, to uh, collectively do the same thing. So have a balance between that. It depends on the context. You have to make your call, okay, in terms of what you think is the best for your team. And next one is regarding visualize impediments. So this is about, you know, you have used Kanban, like Scrum board, similar things. So make those impediments visible, right? So this is where you can see, okay, where things are going, where things are floating. Sometimes you have got impediments at team level, and you probably can see that impediments of management at management level or even executive level. So you can visualize those things. And maybe sometimes there's movement in between as well. So having those visible will definitely help, okay? And then moving down to address impediments. So this is where we need to consider a few things for us to address those things. So first of all, we have established roles, responsibilities, and who's going to do what. And then we'll look at, you know, like, uh, do we have any policies in place which can, you know, literally provide the guidance in terms of how and when, you know, those uh, impediments would actually move status. OK, and also some sort of like metrics saying how we can actually provide some insights into um, what is going on and how are we actually improving? OK, um, are we what, what are we measuring? For example, is the throughput? Is it the, uh, the the size of the queue, the cycle time? What is it? And how are we doing? Are we actually improving or we are not? So having all those things in would definitely help you to provide some indicators. OK, one thing I would say here is start small. Okay, and roll on. So test that your approach out. If it's good, if it's working, and then apply to something else. Don't say that I'm just going to you know do this whole thing to everyone in the team. No, but test small. Okay, test small, and then roll on, and then scale your approach. All right. So next one is about review impediment status. So this is what we need to do on a regular basis. Yeah. So make it a part of your routine and always um, discuss if it's anything systematic you have to address and then trying to take countermeasures to tackle those issues if needed. And the last stage is always remember, OK, how we are changing, how we are adopting and how we are changing the culture. And so we are building transparency, we have open communication, we build trust, accountability, and we are actually working as a collaborative team. So all these matters will help, and then this will actually make it easier and easier to work together as a team to address those impediments which you will face um, you know, in your team or in your organization. All right. So this is a generic approach in terms of when we have particular impediments, how are we going to look at it, right? So I'm not going to be there, okay? And we're not going to have this discussion. So half this approach will help you to define when we have a particular problem, how we're going to address it. So if you look at it, the essence, okay, of this would come down to a few things. Okay, have a quick go through it on my screen. The essence of it will come down to those guiding principles of what we are promoting, okay? Transparency. We are making those impediments visible and we are making the impact of those impediments visible. So we can show how impediments are being managed, so on and so forth. So we talk about the boards, we talk about the metrics just now. So transparency and also collaboration, the team and the management and the leadership, everyone need to work together. Right? And this is how we collaboratively resolve the impediments. And also embracing in, uh, experimentation. So this is where we test our approach, as I've mentioned. And if it works for us, great, let's apply to more teams. If it doesn't work, that's fine. We can pivot, we can change, we can course correct. And next one is on facilitating value delivery. So this is about like the, the focus is to remove impediments so that we can have the smooth flow of value. Okay, remember the focus is always on value. What is the value we're delivering for our team or for our end customers? So let's warrant the, uh, the, the flow of those value. And then the last one I've got here is make sure that we always, always learn and the progress and adopt accordingly. Yeah. So we're seeking out new ways, new method to do things better, even to manage our impediments better and to make the process, the environment easier so that the team can stay on course. OK, so if you look at this, this is nothing new. You are aware of Agile, you are aware of Kanban, you are aware of Kaizen. These are the concepts which is literally supporting the guiding principles behind. 
Okay. So on that end, right, let's take a very quick minute. So I've been talking a lot, and then I would like you to take a minute and think about saying now, okay, based on what you have heard, what are some of the key takeaways from today, please? Yeah, because this reflection will make all the discussion, all the learning yours. Okay, that's the only way. So take a minute to reflect and we'll continue in terms of uh, introducing some of the learning passes and how we can progress forward. Okay, I hope you all managed to have some time to reflect and in terms of what are your key takeaways. And what I would like to do next is just give you a very brief introduction of the certified trainings, like ICRG certified trainings, which we do, which can help you to provide like a further advancement in your journey. So um, for ICRG, they have got different learning tracks and we have a list of few here. So on the top, we have got the Agile team coaching. Okay, so this is the uh, fundamental and team facilitation as well as Agile coaching course, ATF, uh, ATF and ACC. So if you're working as a Scrum Master, if you're working as an Agile coach, and if you're working closely with your team, and this could be very useful because it gives you the needed skills to design and, you know, um, and uh, to design those collaborative meetings and help your teams to work together to achieve higher level of maturity, okay? And for the coaching, so if you are in a coaching, co uh, sorry, if you're working as an agile coach, then, you know, this does not only focus on the skills, um, you know, for coaching, but also like the mindset of coaches as well. So um, if you are working on this and we are going to discuss a few things regarding like a different uh, competencies, you know, for agile coaches and how we can use these uh, competencies to help you to build um, like self-organizing teams. Okay. And that's on the team level. And moving on to the Enterprise Agile Coaching Program or Learning Path, we have got ENT and CAT. So from my end, uh, ENT is more Enterprise Agile Coaching. is focused a bit more on the um, organizational part of the whole story. So you will be talking about organizational structures and organizational um, like changes. And for the CAT, it's focused a bit more on the human side. So how are we going to work with the leaders? You know, how are we going to you know support them? And how are we going to um, you know, um, coach them uh, doing this agile transformation journey. And obviously, if you're working as leaders in the team, we have got agility in the leadership uh, path as well. We have got Leah, which is leading with agility as well as people development. Okay, so it depends on what you want, and we can support you in different learning journey. So as of, and um, if you don't have anything, then, you know, it's uh, my pleasure to have you on board, and I'm looking forward to see you in the next webinar.